Hey everybody. Wait till uh, some folks join in. Good to see you guys. Gonna give uh, the first few who are coming in, you get midweek hug. Come here, come here. Come on, right there. Good to see y'all. It's been a while. Man, we got some things to go through. It's gonna be fun. You know the thing I like about this is it's just a little sector of the internet that we get to communicate. It's the few hundred people we can congregate here and it's not through the filter of an interview. I feel like I can talk about the things that maybe weren't kosher to bring up in proper interviews or um, certain like written articles and certainly these are not going to be things that are going to come up in the bio or press releases. But it's things that I find myself talking to uh, behind closed doors when I'm meeting with artists or possible collaborators. And part of the mission this year for me as I'm beginning to venture into new music and start this new chapter is I wanted to take you guys with me and bring you behind these closed doors as this stuff comes together. Because I, I, I really think it's interesting and I think there's a gap of getting to see a certain part of the process um, you normally don't. And there's good reason. It's a lot of times unflattering, but I think, I don't know, I think it's essential. And so there's a significant part of the journey that I feel never got talked about in the Mute Math story arc and probably for good reason. And it brings up a very, to me, a valid concept of where art meets commerce. And it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to create in, in, in that framework. And it's even more uncomfortable to talk about, but it's essential because it's, it's just part of it. If you ever get the honor of getting to make a living at making music or at anything creative. There are demons that you will wrestle with and it's not always, I guess, commonplace to talk about. And it's hard to find people to talk about those things. For me, it was always within the band as we were trying to figure out, there was no textbook. There's no, what do we do in this situation? Um, should we put this song on the album? Is it a hit song? What does a hit song even mean? And it's wigging us out. So let's dive into it. I think where we left off last week, you know, I wound up talking about Kings for a while as we were talking about the Voice in the Silence EP and I never really got to mention some of the other songs. But a lot of those were written around that time of going into Armistice. Sooner or later was a song idea that kind of dropped out of the sky while I was working on the Jeremy Larson album. Was that in 06? It was uh, running an errand, leaving the studio for a while, and that chorus just dropped. And I wound up finding some time uh, after the Jeremy Larson project was done to demo that up before we went back on tour. And it was right around the time Voice in the Silence happened and we were trying to figure out what song we we're gonna include in the set and start trying out live. And I think we learned a lot of expensive lessons in Armistice. You know, Mute Math never really had a, uh, a commercial, I guess, breakthrough. The closest we came was typical and where we really felt what that song was doing. And it was right after we had made a video. And you know what? N no one really thought that song was gonna do anything. We turned in that album. I mean, we knew it was special and it was, the... when we were playing it live, we opened the album with it. We opened the show with it. It was an important song, but I don't know if you remember, the first song that was released on that debut album was Chaos. That was the one that they thought was the breakaway single. And it did okay, but it, it flattened out pretty quick. And we just took our cue from being on the road and seeing what the reaction was like to typical to say, well, maybe that should be a song we should make a video for. 
And we were fortunate enough to make a video that really reacted, and it was at just at the right time where, um, I guess YouTube was kind of becoming a thing, and just this viral video thing happened for us with Typical, and um, next thing you know, we're on these festivals, we're getting late night offers, and radio starts picking up, shows are selling out, we're going to the next venue size. It was very exciting. And that was the closest we ever came to feeling when a song went out and did work for you and then helped bring you to a new level. After that, it was always just trying to find um, the songs that could uh, keep the train moving. You know, talk about how the word hit became a bad word. Um, and I felt like record executives got some sort of memo that said, guys, we have to stop using that word. I think we're wigging out certain artists, especially artists like Mute Math, and we're saying, we need a hit, guys. Uh, we need something. They start freaking out, and they, don't, they start writing trite stuff. What do we do? So we start using different terminology. I remember being in A&R meetings where it was like, we just, you know, we just need that song that we can license or we can, it'll be a single that a lot of people will like or one that you can, you know, close the show with and, and beginning to look at it from different angles so that it can just uh, provoke just trying to swing for the fence with, with some sort of song that might make a mark and help your career and all your invested partners. So with Mute Math, it was, it was challenging because I think I realized that the DNA of Mute Math and the artistic mission, I think mostly took precedent over the commercial mission. And that made it very tricky in the major label system. And we just hoped and banked on that our artistic endeavors would find commercial success. But it wasn't that easy. It wasn't that easy for us. I think we had watched enough behind the music and seen stories of, of different bands' careers that maybe the fantasy of that seemed possible. But you know, the, the ad, like in the NFL, for every Tom Brady, for, for every star, for every Drew Brees, there's a, hundreds of other guys who never, they get so close, they're on the roster, but they don't quite get that NFL career um, and it's not that I mean we, we certainly had a great time made a great living at what we did but we got to a place where our band was not growing as fast as our families as as fast as our lives and we were outgrowing our band I think that was a big part of why it started to fray and why um, it well, we're ultimately not here but the lasting takeaway is what are those songs? What are those songs that make a difference? And, and when I sit across the table from a new artist and they're trying to navigate that and figure that out, a lot of times I just tell my experience with it. The non-hit experience, but how we might have come close. On Armistice, it was supposed to be lost year. And if you ask me what's my least favorite song that Mute Matt's ever recorded, it would be Lost Year. Hands down, if I had a do-over, I would take it on that song. And I think the original demo of it felt alluring and exciting. And then all of a sudden, producers and, and labels were, were speaking into what should happen. And I think we weren't sure what we wanted to do with it. And... It was an arduous process to get that song across the finish line to where we felt it it still felt like something we wanted to do or it was just a vanilla ballad. Um, wasn't I didn't feel like maybe I was singing about something I cared about anymore. Just through the process of making that record, it wound up on the album and it did nothing. We really didn't play it in our shows. And I don't think we were inspired to. And I think our takeaway after that experience was we don't want to have those. 
you know, the simple solution is always write songs that you like. You know, don't put out anything that you don't love and would stand, and would stand behind. And it's just not that simple sometimes because you can really love an idea for a short period of time and for some reason it doesn't stand up even a year later or you don't like it as much as you did or it doesn't resonate with you as much. And those are really tough to predict. You don't know when that's gonna happen. Coming out of Odd Soul, Mute Math was on the chopping block at Warner Brothers. And they had given us freedom to try it our own way on Odd Soul, and we did. We, just so you know, in a normal major label system, an artist who has a breakout moment, you obviously are gonna always get a chance to follow that up. If the follow-up doesn't go as well, you usually get one more chance. So you get two follow-ups when you have a breakthrough moment. So for us, after the debut, Armistice didn't do as well. We kind of were on the chopping block going to Odd Soul had it not been for a regime change. And Rob Cavallo, who came in as the president, loved us and wanted to give us a chance. So we got Odd Soul across the finish line, much thanks uh, to Rob Cavallo and the new team that came in, Jamie Neely and Julian Raymond, who got in the studio with us to really help try to milk something out of those songs. And for us in our camp, instead of using the word hit, and no one was ever like, we need that, we need to find, you start using different terminology. And for us, we use the term engine. We need to find these engine songs because there's always those one or two songs on an album that's gonna do the work and kind of pull the whole train. And for Odd Soul, it wound up being blood pressure. But there was still that missing breakthrough moment that Warner Brothers needed from us and that we were aspiring to. And so after the Odd Soul cycle ended, I was like, what do we do now? We got our studio and we started writing. Well, they threw out the idea, pitched us the idea that maybe we should start doing co-writes and I should try to expand my horizons. Maybe I've had these near misses and I should start trying to get with other writers outside of the band to see if we could find that breakthrough engine song to take everything to the next level. Well, I was really nervous about that and I didn't want to do it at all. I'd never written with anyone outside of people that I was in a band with, especially for the band that I was in. Because I'd done a few little outside writing things, but, but I'd always felt like, well, we're going to make new maps, so it's got to be with the guys in the band. But we were on the chopping block. And we, were, we all talked about it and agreed that, gosh, we're, we're going to get dropped if we don't come up with something that works. And everything that we were writing at that time, post Odd Soul, no one was excited about. And they weren't going to green light our album. So we were in this, we were falling into this strange purgatory world that it's very cliche for bands that were at our level to fall into. And we weren't going to get priority. We weren't going to get a record release date. We weren't going to get a budget. But I was hell bent to try to find a way to make it work. What do we have to do? And we kept writing and writing. So I'm like, Look, I'm going, to, I'll go to LA. I'll do it. Who we got to, who we got to meet? <laughs> and our guy was, was really, uh, sensitive to me being a newbie to the co-write thing and he tried to set it up as thoughtfully as possible. And I, would, I went there for weeks and I would just go and I was introduced to the LA songwriting machine for the first time and just going meeting after meeting and just writing a song with someone that you just met. And it was exhilarating, quite honestly. I met a lot of awesome people. Uh, we had a great time. I couldn't tell you that I was extremely excited about the music that was coming of it. I was telling myself that I'm just going to write songs. No pressure of it trying to be mute math. And you know, you have to, you have to check out to a degree when you get in these creative circles and, and, and leave your agenda at the door and just be willing to be in the moment and chase whatever is there. And I remember in the midst of the whirlwind of that, 
session after session. I have a whole new respect for those guys who do it because those those guys are just cranking out hundreds, over around 100 of songs a year, and you just never know what's going to happen to it. And, you know, you're meeting the next artist, and you're going, and you're going. It's tough. It's really tough. And as I was in the middle of that, I remember getting the call from our a &R guy who said, congratulations, Paul. You just wrote a hit song. I'm like, what? And I was turning in the stuff as it was coming out of these sessions, and I was lost track of it all. It's like, well, which one is it? And he told me what song. I said, you're kidding, right? There's no way. There's no way it's that song, right? And this was a song that I wrote with a lovely British gentleman by the name of Warren Hewitt that I'm going to play for you right now. Because would you like to know what it sounds like when you go into L.A. writing sessions and then all of a sudden you walk away with a song that your label Feels like the lights just went on. It's like, okay, here we go. Now we got something we can work with. So this is what they heard. I'm going to play it for you. It's a song called Drowning. We're reading the comments too. Curious how it'll hit you. It's the original demo, all right? backstory on this. I met Warren Hewitt going into this session. Awesome guy. I knew he was a great guitar player. I was looking forward to getting in a session. It was going to be my first guitar player session I was with. I was usually with programmers, other piano players, singers. So I was like, all right, man, we're just going to, we're just going to go for something, right? We just crank up the amps. And uh, we spent the majority of that day just having great conversation, we talk about politics, religion, and everything you're not supposed to talk about on the first time. But we were really coming. We had a great, great time just hanging. And then it was the end of the day. We're like, well, I guess we should write a song, huh? Well, let's just do it. And so I'm like, well, come on, what, what amps do you want to pull out? And he's like, oh, no, no, I like writing on acoustic. I'm like, really? Okay, all right. So he pulls out his acoustic guitar and he just starts playing this generic D chord. It's like I was thinking about something like this and, was, and I was immediately feeling deflated like, okay, all right, we're doing a ballad. I wasn't really hoping to do that. And I just sat down at the piano and we just kind of slopped through a progression and like, okay, that's good. That's good. And I started singing this drowning thing and he was like, oh, I like that. And we did, we did this, uh, put this together in a couple hours probably. I think I came back the next morning and we finished up the lyrics. I didn't think much of this song. I was just, I was on to the next session. And I wasn't particularly, I, and this is no slight against Warren, I wasn't particularly proud of this song either. I was completely disconnected from it. I don't even know what I was singing about, but all of a sudden, when you have the people at the label telling you, this is the one. This is the one we can get behind. And then I had to play it for the band. Now imagine playing that for the band for the first time. All right, this is this is the one everyone's excited about. 
And at the time, we were starting to write songs like Used To and Monument, Stratosphere. We're going into 2014. Um, and feeling like we were finding the direction that we wanted sonically, artistically, even message-wise. And we felt like, I don't know if this song fits in all that. So we decided to try and record it because we knew that was the only way that the album was going to get green lit. We could have a budget and get a release date. So we recorded this. So this was taking, yeah, this was just us in the studio now as a band recording something to try to do the demo justice, but making it feel like a direction we wanted to go. Oh, what we were having was last year flashbacks during this. We're like, okay, well, before we start fielding what everyone wants to do with this demo, let us figure out what we would like to do with this song, if it's going to be anything. And I'll tell you, we were a little scared. This is, this is not what we were hoping was going to be the type of song that was going to excite the label and get us a new record. We were pretty determined coming out of Odd Soul that what we wanted to write was a Gnarls Barkley crazy. That's the type of song. Not... Oh, I'm going to think of a bad example, but to be really extreme, an arms wide open. We don't want to, we don't want to go after that. That's not what we're after. It's not the type of breakthrough song we want to put out. And so we were feeling pretty unconfident about this song. And so we just, out of blind faith and out of sheer work ethic, decided let's record it and give it a fair shake and see what we come up with. And this is what it sounded like. don't feel like it's the best ballad Mute Math has ever had, but it's not the worst. It's certainly in the zone to me. It's a nice chorus. So you can see we were, we were trying to exercise restraint and not go to completely left field. We weren't going to Gnarls Barkley <laughs> crazy ambitions. We were, trying to, we were trying to stay right here. And it was working. It's a nice bridge. Down each other, are we true? 
this is checking the boxes from you, Math, and I think we were feeling more comfortable about it. So we we're feeling a little more confident in the song now. It's like, okay, well maybe we can stomach this being in the catalog. And for whatever reason, uh, the record is just like, that's, that's good, but this is not how the record should be. We weren't producing it and taking it a place that was helping the cause in their eyes. And they were hell-bent on, we need to find a proper producer to get in the studio with you guys and make sure this song is bulletproof. And they were hell-bent on, I'm saying hell-bent a lot, aren't I? <laughs> this is, this is uh, drudging that up, isn't it? Eric Valentine, that was the guy. That was the guy they wanted. And I... He was not in our list of potential guys that we were even looking at. I never even thought about Eric Valentine. But they, they loved Eric and thought he was, would be a, a great guy to get in the studio with. It seemed like a stylistic mismatch to us. After seeing what, it, in context of the whole Eric Valentine work to now, I mean, he was definitely more of a rock guy. And I think we started setting our sights on more of an electronic, dancier vibe towards Vitals, where that was going. So we're thinking, maybe that's not the, the best match, but let's meet him. This is the guy that the label, actually the only guy the label was willing to green light the record for, is if he was on board. Like, well, we should meet him. Eric's awesome. And he's a fantastic producer. I'm a big fan of a lot of the stuff he's done. I was getting a crash course on it as we were meeting him. And very insightful to the songs. And he loved this song. Thought it was great. Now, by the time we had met Eric, we had begun to unravel our confidence in this song. And we started trying all kinds of things. And we're like, well, what if we got more ambitious with it? And so we started playing... <laughs> A few versions of Drowning to Eric Valentine, and I'm going to play you this version. This is when we went for broke on, let's just go mute math with it, guys, whatever that meant to us at the time. And this is what we played for Eric, and I'm going to show you his reaction. <laughs> Is this the same song? Oh yeah, here comes the mute There's some facet of it. We were lost another night. Everyone. Put it on vitals. Motion spent and only put us down. We're not here anymore, we're getting a little more here. We're getting out of the box. As we were playing this for Mr. Valentine, I remember he just went. Listen, we're probably not the best thing for this song. It's a remix. It seemed like uh, historically we were good at remixes. So I remember having, we, we had a, a very sobering conversation and ultimately we didn't make the record with Eric Eric couldn't do it um, he was actually made the made an amazing decision which was to do the Grace Potter record at the time that was what he was trying to decide between and 
Of course, that worked out great. He married Grace. They have a family now. So, I mean, that was a big life decision for Eric. And congrats to him. On the flip side of the coin, Eric was not going to do the album for us. And that left us in an awkward spot at Warner Brothers. And we had a regime change. So Rob, Rob was gone. They brought in a new president. And the new president was making cuts. And we got cut. And I got the call from our awesome A&R guy who had been there with us. And he just broke it to me. I've been dropped three times in my music career. And this, this one stung the most because we had worked so hard to try to get the relationship to work and try to make, yeah, we really felt a part of Warner Brothers and what was going on. So when I, when I had the realization, that he said, Warner decided not to pick up the next option. So this is it, I was like, wow. And um, as tough as it was to realize that, it was sort of a weight being lifted because we had spent probably a year and a half in this sort of writing purgatory and not sure what was ever going to happen if we were going to wind up with a record and with a producer and with uh, an ambition that we were aligned with. So that's, that's when we went indie and it all, I wouldn't say all, but most of it was circling around this song and we couldn't, yeah, we couldn't come to an agreement on how to record it. I think when they started seeing where we were probably going to take this song, it was demoralizing for our record company team. And there was always those type of things where we wondered if Mute Math had gotten in its own way. The idea of Mute Math as an artistic endeavor had gotten in its way. You know, I, I can specifically remember times when, you know, the, the song In No Time was a big moment for me as a songwriter, especially had having, having come out of some of the issues that I was tabling on Armistice and Odd Soul was this return to sort of like why we started um, kind of putting beliefs in our story. And, and when I say beliefs, I mean like faith and the idea of how we came up and whatever demons we were wrestling with our particular upbringing and religion and church, we're putting it together in Odd Soul. And In No Time was a big song for me to write in, in making peace with that. And Warner Brothers was so excited about that song, but they swore up and down to me that I screwed it up the way I was producing it out. And it's like, it's arranged wrong. If we could just arrange it differently. And I remember Julian, God bless him. He, he worked so hard to try to negotiate that. But we saw it as an album closer. It is not to be treated like a single. We're not doing the verse, chorus, verse, chorus formula. And we battled with that for a long time. And... I'm proud of the way In No Time turned out. But it makes me wonder how many times along the way did we get in our own way? And I wonder if that's even possible uh, for, for artists to do. Sometimes you wonder if maybe you're just not working with the right people, if, if it's not about enabling the artists you're with, if you are fearing that they're going to mess something up. Should you even be working together? All right, I'm gonna tell you my John Mayer story. This this is one that's not gonna be in interviews, but what we got is like, okay, not, there's like 350 people. So this is fine. It'll be gone in 24 hours. During the debut era, it was right after we had played Typical on Letterman, 
I got an email in my inbox from John Mayer. Now, just to give you a little backstory, I found out later that it was CAA or someone gave him my email address because he had saw our performance on Letterman, um, had listened to our record, was finding out about us, seemed excited about it, but wanted to reach out to me because he had to tell me something. And within the, within the email, he told me, look, man, what you guys have created is great, but you need to go back and trim out some of the instrumental stuff, a lot of the schwumbly bits, the ambience, and just bring it back down. There's too many things that are upstaging the songs. Which at this point, we had already re-released the album. Um, it was 2007. We'd been working it for like two years. It's like, I don't, I appreciate it. If this even is the real John Mayer, it seemed like it was. And we said, I remember thanking him for his unsolicited advice, <laughs> but we were going to stick with what we had. We really liked the album. And what I realized that we were being asked to do and maybe asked to do through many points of our career was to take the mute math, or what we thought was the mute math, out of our songs. And it left us in an identity crisis a lot when we were trying to pick songs or figure out how to produce them and even find our own peace with them within the band. And it was something that we couldn't accept. And I am, I am someone who's pretty hell-bent on, there it is again. <laughs> I felt like in the last stream I did, I said context a lot. I told myself, stop saying context so much. But now it's hell-bent, got a new word. I'll, I'll, I'll weed that one out by the next time we, we're talking. I was determined to make it work, whatever it was. We're going to find our way. We're going to find a way to make the songs that connect. And it's still us. And it's How do we put the pieces together? And it would be the kind of thing where I'd, I would run us through the ringer within the band, where it was like, let's try this, we'll try that. Let's just keep writing. Let's, let's keep finding a way. We'll redo the song. Let's re-record it. Let's... Do we arrange it right? To the point where we're just, we're zombies. We're just, after weeks on something, we're just laying there on the floor like, I don't know if this is good anymore. I have no idea. I need to go to sleep. Um, maybe we should just move on to something else. And that was probably my ambition to a detriment. If I can just throw that out. And it was unsustainable. We had to find a way to be able to work faster, work more inspired, and then move on to the next one and not get stuck. And I think my sheer bulldoggedness of just trying to figure it out and if a song was kind of working to just keep chipping away and figuring out, I'd get bogged down in one idea for too long. I'm gonna end on this story. <laughs> this will give you, this will give you it. But I'm gonna turn it around. And and here's here's the takeaway. The takeaway is, I'm still not giving up. I'm still determined to find ways to be a part of songs that can break through, that can resonate on a on a higher level. You know, maybe the mute math framework wasn't exactly built for that to happen, or we we couldn't quite massaged the song ideas in a way that, that reached further than us. But I still am a believer in that's the music I want to make. I still want to be a part with artists who, who want to find their own way and, and make those songs, um, I don't know, that connect. Um, there's there's nothing there's nothing like that. I mean, the few times that Mute Math had experienced that, um, we felt pretty lucky. We were 
in the middle of touring on the self-titled album and we got a chance to have the song The Fight. Remember The Fight? Pitched for a Spider-Man movie. We only had one day to get it done. It was a deadline. And we were playing a show. We had to fly into Nashville to put, we had to do a red, red eye flight to Nashville, record all day, possibly into the night, and then get back on a plane and go to the next show. And just burning the candle at both ends to try to make this happen. And this just will give you an example of how I would push, uh, which perhaps was not healthy all the time. I think I've mellowed out over the years because I just have to couldn't run at this pace. We get there, we're zombies walk in the studio, we gotta try to piece the song together, we turn it from a demo into a record so we can pitch it for this movie. Work all day, into the night, it's not quite done. Uh, the producer, Ted, Ted T, who worked on the first album with us, he said, all right, I get, I'm going home, I'll see you in the morning. The engineer left and, and me and Darren were gonna try and finish some comping and come back with fresh ears in the morning and figure out if it's any good before we leave. <laughs> we worked into like three, four in the morning trying to pound coffee, whatever we could do to, to stay up. And at some point I remember Darren fell asleep in the control room and I'm just trying to make it happen. I had to go into the drum room to adjust the microphone for something because this is all I remember. I laid down to adjust the microphone. And then the next thing I remembered was I guess it was the next morning and the producer, Ted, was poking at me. He's like, dude, are you okay? Are you all right? I'm like, what's going on? He's like, what happened? And I realized I woke up, I was in a puddle of my own piss. <laughs> I was in the drum room and he's like, man, are you okay? What happened? Are, were you, are you drunk? Like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. No, I was just exhausted. So exhausted, I just fell asleep in the drum room, pissed all over myself, and he woke me up the next morning. He's like, I got clients here to come see the studio. What do we do? And it's like, he had the engineer hold him off in the waiting room, and me and Ted run into the bathroom, get a bunch of Scott towels, and we're, we're cleaning up the mess. <laughs> But that would be the sheer determination of just trying to get something done. So I'll leave you on that. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining. We'll, uh, we'll pick up another time. Cheers.